We're going live. Okay, we are live. Ooh, fun. We're live. Um, it usually takes a minute for notifications to come through, and I think there's like a 10 second delay or something. Um, wait, cool. Is this where we do awkward small talk until? Yeah. Um, so tell me, where'd you get that shirt? It's, uh, um, I presumed you were speaking to me. Yes. Uh, yeah, I thought I should brighten up my uh, my wardrobe a little bit, and uh, yeah, for some funky new things. So white for yellow, and it matches my Seinfeld hat, which I'm very hey, stoked. Guys. Did you do that on purpose? No, not really. Um, it it just you know lucky accident. Yeah. I think you have a subconscious part of you <laughs> that matches all of your clothing to your Seinfeld hat, though. Partly, yeah. I did also <laughs> like buy a whole new range because I have I have a very small head, right? So like. Caps for me, I buy them online. It's a 50 50 chance whether they'll fit my head or just look ridiculous. And so I yeah, found the opposite one, problem. Yeah, one uh, eBay where you sell lots of like uh, caps with different logos on them. So I just like bought a huge ton of them where I know like this one fits. So I'm going to get loads of them. That's yeah. a great idea. Hey guys. Uh, hey Matt. Hey so Hey Kyle. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing? Um, oh, let me switch over on this side. There we go. Hey. Hi, Sophie. Hey, Matt. Thank you, um, Matt. It's a beautiful day. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a sunshiny Made Brave live stream um, at lunchtime. We're going to be talking about content. Hey, Hannah. Um, how could it get any better? Um, I'm really, really excited for this one. Um, let me, I'll just wait a little bit longer to see if anybody, oh, we got 17. That's not bad. See if anybody else jumps on. Um, if anybody else, um, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, now it's working, sorry. I'm trying to do two things at once. It doesn't work out sometimes. Okay, um, so yeah, let me get going here. I'll share my screen. I'm just gonna show just some quick slides, just really, really quick, just to introduce everybody uh, to Made Brave if you're not familiar with us already. Uh, we are, um, bum, 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 bum. yeah, we are a strategic brand agency based here in Glasgow. Uh, we have about 40 people on the team. Uh, we have brand strategists, we have designers, we have animators, we have illustrators. Uh, we also have an in-house content production team that creates film, 3D animations, uh, they create photography, uh, they do digital, uh, we, have, we also have a digital team that covers UX, UI, uh, digital designs, websites, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then we also have a couple of Made Brave dogs uh, that are up to no good. Um, One of them is sitting at my feet. <laughs> right, so currently up to no good. Um, <laughs> really, really great. Um, so that, yeah, that's our, that's our marketing manager, Harvey the Spaniel. Yeah. Uh, so we were recently named the top 100 independent agencies by the drum we've also been named uh, campaigns one of campaigns best places to work last year uh, uh, and we've worked with a number of amazing brands over the years many of them being global businesses and across all kinds of different uh, sectors uh, and industries which is really great because you get to you know you get to kind of cross pollinate different ideas and ways of thinking um, across uh, different clients so it's really great it uh, just gives us a kind of fresh perspective, I think. Um, you know, we used to spend our days in our brand new Glasgow-based studio, which we had just moved into uh, at the start of the year. Uh, and now all we have are these, well, it's still there, but we just, <laughs> all we have is to look at these pictures um, that, that are, I mean, at least we got really nice pictures done uh, before we had to move out because of the lockdown. Um, but hopefully, fingers crossed, won't be too long. Uh, before we get back in there. Um, so uh, just in the real, for the office. I know. <laughs> I know. I, and, I, and every once in a while, somebody goes in to do a shoot and we're all like looking over their shoulder. What, what, what's it like when we're in a Zoom call? Um, in fact, well, Perry, Perry, you're in the you're in the other office right now in Edinburgh, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. I wanted to get a nicer looking place than my bedroom. Right. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, so, it's, so for those of you that have been following along with us, uh, we've been doing this relaunch strategy uh, kind of for a while. It's been an ongoing theme for us. Uh, there's plenty of uncertainty out there, as we all know. 
but there are things that you can do to plan for certain contingencies. Uh, and we've actually talked about this during a previous live stream, uh, which you can watch here on LinkedIn. And it's also up on YouTube if you want to check that out. Uh, it's a great resource. Uh, during our last live chat, I was joined by Emma Burnett Blair, who is our head of marketing, and Mark Kulin, uh, our head of strategy. We talked about brand evolution versus rebrands, what they are, what they're for, uh, and kind of pro con for each. Uh, both of them are so knowledgeable about uh, branding and marketing strategy. There's just tons and tons in there. If you want to go digging, uh, it, again, it's here on LinkedIn. It's in, it's on YouTube, and then it's also embedded in a blog post. Uh, if you want to go to madebrave.com slash blog. Uh, today, though, I am joined by Heather Robertson, who is a marketing executive here at Made Brave. And then we have Perry Johnson, who is our content director. Um, today, we're going to be talking about content trends from lockdown. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about what these trends say for the future of content and kind of where we're headed next. Uh, you know, so if we've done our job today, everyone should be able to take some insights insights away from them or away with them um, to apply to their own marketing strategy. Um, you know, a lot of businesses have had to change over the last six months uh, like never before. We know that um, that's that's kind of just been on repeat for for months and months. But you know, contents had to change along with that. So businesses had strategies and marketing and content plans in place for months, especially if you think, if you consider we were all just coming off of Christmas and there were all kinds of learnings. Oh, okay, that worked really well. This didn't. Let's do this for Q1, Q2. So all of that kind of had to be scrapped, whether, you know, whether you were in an industry that, that ended up doing really well and, and needed to pivot or, or the, the other way. Um, so, you know, just as, as a lot of businesses have discovered that working from home or blended work is not only possible, but preferable, depending on who you ask. Um, you know, they've also discovered that there are new content types um, that, that are, you know, they're better, they're, they're more effective, maybe they're, they're cheaper to execute, whatever it is. Um, and they were kind of forced into that. But, um, you know, it, it's just interesting to see that there are learning on, learnings on both sides of that. Um, you know, for example, Burberry uh, started focusing more on computer generated and 3D versions of their products. Um, they started blending that with photography. If you go check out their website, it's, it's really, really cool what they've done. You look at their Instagram page as well. Uh, you know, people are just spending more time on their phones than ever. Uh, a lot of different social media platforms are reporting, you know, anywhere between 40 and 70 percent increase uh, time on site. Uh, which is really significant. So again, Burberry, if we look at them, what do they do? They create a video game on Instagram, uh, which is really, really cool. Um, if you want to go check that out. Uh, I mean, it's not Red Dead Redemption 2, but I mean, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, anyway, so let's, let's kind of get on with it. I put some questions together for Heather and for Perry. Uh, I, of course, gave them plenty of time to to prepare, uh, but hopefully this kind of loosens things up and kind of just turns this into a conversation versus a webinar, which is tons and tons of slides. Uh, I think this is just a little bit more fun. Also, as you guys are watching, you're there in the comments, just feel free to ask questions as we're moving along. We might answer the question in there if we see it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll do kind of a Q&A at the end and we can get it uh, at that point. Uh, so just for a quick overview, we've kind of we've identified 11 content trends from the last six months, uh, and we we put all of that into a blog post that's going to go live this afternoon. Uh, but in the meantime, we do have a few that we kind of just wanted to chat with, chat through that we think are a little bit more interesting uh, and probably the most likely to to grow over the coming months. Uh, but first, though, um, kind of our first question, I, you know, something I thought we should probably address, uh, just to kind of preface everything, is, you know, maybe we should talk about content across the board. Uh, so Perry, Heather, you know, ha has there really been a big shift in digital marketing uh, during the pandemic? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, I think that in marketing, um, we're, we're in quite a fortunate position in that we have the real world marketing that we can do and we also have the digital world marketing that we can do mm -hmm. so when the pandemic hit and real world stuff had to disappear or and or, or get put on hold or get cancelled then 
we were in a fortunate position that we can say right so how can we take this into the platforms that we know as you just said people are on social media more and they're using their phones more they're they're at home so kind of got a bit more of a captive audience there yeah so we've been so lucky in that we've been able to kind of um shift budget towards digital more um i think that this was a wider trend anyway i think that we were seeing more um digital marketing going going forward um, and that the pandemic has just really lit a fire under it um, i think that experiences have had to change you know we've seen um in the past couple of decades in marketing experiential marketing has really um has really come to the forefront of how we do things because mm -hmm. we started with functional marketing really product-based stuff but then as that became more commoditized that was where brand came in and it became more about building an emotional connection with your audience and driving loyalty through essentially selling products that are really quite similar and then that moved into experiential where it became about um giving customers uh like on the ground experience where whether that be um in like just on the ground in a mall or mm -hmm. um, a purpose-built event a building that kind of thing um and that hits a really small audience but um you can you can extend that of course in the digital space by making it um shareable by generating user content and um, using hashtags and things but unfortunately um we were we were kind of just coming to the sweet spot of that before the pandemic hit so our imaginations would run wild we'd think oh it'd be amazing if we could do this, that, all these all these amazing things but the technology maybe would be really expensive or not yet invented and recently in the past few years certainly since i started at made brave it's become really accessible and it's been possible to do these things like an example was when we put a um a bus and a toy box in george square and um, mm. launch first buses new buses which was super experiential and great and we got loads of user generated content from it but that's all had to stop so i think that in response to your question i think that the um that companies are moving more towards digital experiences with the tools that they know they have at home what is possible how can we immerse our, our potential customers our client base in our brand through not actually being able to have any face-to-face -face interaction with them or any like brand um interaction with them in the real world um and i think it's become more about long-form digital experiences and um, for example um i do social listening um for quite a lot of our clients and for anyone that's more interested in that we did a webinar on that and we've got a blog on that on the website as well um and i do a quarterly social listening report where i look at what's going on with this client but also what's going on with the competitors and everybody's experienced the pandemic like we're all it's all a level playing field um, and it was interesting to see that some of the competitors had obviously they had to pull back from their trade shows and things and their mm -hmm financial stuff but they would moved more into podcasts and webinars and face-to-face right. -face, um like meetings and things like that that you can like as a as a customer, you could book a slot with someone, um, and it's really just about about just finding ways to make yourself as relevant as you can in a space where you know people are sitting, looking at their phones and and looking at their screens because they're in their house um, and they don't have the distraction of the real world. So really, it's almost like you've got more of a captive audience, yeah. which is nice um, and. It's always a welcome thing when so many businesses have struggled throughout the pandemic. So it's just it's one of these things that's been quite it's been quite a nice reassurance to know that people are using the channels more. So mm -hmm. invest more in digital content is isn't as risky as you might think. Right. Right. I don't know if Perry, if you've been I just spoke for ages. So I don't know if Perry <laughs> no, that's really good. That was really <laughs> great. I enjoyed hearing you talk. Um, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, lockdown was such an interesting time from like a content creation perspective, just because all of a sudden you can't be on set. All of a sudden you can't even be in the studio, you know, and it just like the challenges that pose. But I mean, from my from my point of view, I always uh, love a good challenge. I think it's why I love production in general and sort of the, the production agency world is because it's all creative problem solving. 
And lockdown was definitely a big uh, opportunity for some creative problem solving, you know, where you just, you can't film things now uh, unless it's by yourself in your living room, but all the messaging still needs to go out. Uh, how, do yeah. we, how do we change the narrative uh, and create sort of, uh, create the content that we need that carry the messages through, but with these new restrictions. So, I mean, that was definitely interesting. And, you know, you saw a lot of 3D come out and uh, that's something we did a lot after lockdown. Um, but also just like, yeah, shooting things yourself in, in sort of the studio or in your bedroom, you know, if you're clever about it, there's so much you can do. Uh, you, all you need really is a camera and some small basic tools and you can really do so much. It's just about being able to be creative and overcome those barriers, I think. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, so I think for this, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're just going to kind of chat through, you know, Heather, you mentioned this one already a little bit, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk through some of these trends. This first one is, is long form video content. So, you know, this, this one, you know, when I, when I heard about this recently, it, you know, I was kind of taken aback a little bit because it's, it, it's a little bit counterintuitive just because, uh, we've, we've sort of been told for years that actually, you know, you want to make things as short as people have really short attention spans. They don't want to see your ad. Um, they just want to scroll past. So long form is not the way to go. Um, but actually it's, it's the opposite. Um, and, and it's changing. You know, so um, it's a rising trend that, you know, that, that brands like Patagonia ha have done really, really well, um, especially in the last few months. And it's, you know, it's this kind of stuff where you go, you suddenly forget that you were trying to watch a YouTube video. <laughs> You're like, oh, no, this is an ad. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> but yeah, why, why with, with long form video, why this, why this increase? Why do you guys think this is happening? Yeah, I think it's I think it's really interesting to look at sort of uh, this trend as you mentioned of like ads getting shorter but video content getting longer. Mm. Uh, and I think it's just like it's the result of uh, brands and content creators sort of getting clever with how they're utilizing various platforms because we know that longer form content performs better on YouTube. Uh, yeah. And so you have to sort of cater your your content to the platforms that you intend to put them on. And obviously you need to choose your platforms based on where you think your audience is or based on what kind of content you want to be producing. You know, if you feel like long form content is better for getting your messaging across then you know, you want to go to YouTube. Uh, and you know, short uh, and long form content both have their sort of benefits and drawbacks. Obviously, uh, I don't think it's a case that attention spans are getting shorter, um, and so we need to make shorter content. I think it's just more about sort of uh, we've now proven that YouTube is a popular platform and that you can successfully advertise on YouTube. Uh, so it's just a case of sort of leveraging that. Uh, and I really think it all comes down to advertising as entertainment, which is like. It, it's been my big thing for years, and I think it's only becoming more and more relevant. It's people don't want to be advertised to. Like that's that's just the way it is. Uh, the exception is if if you're given something that you want to watch, you know, not something you're forced to watch. Uh, and so the trick for me is always to find the balance between story and brand, and to sort of uh, figure out how to make stuff that that is less skippable uh, mm -hmm. without an audience attention. Uh, because, you know, a lot of the time narratives are rubbish uh, or they're non-existent and all, all you get is functional messaging. And people don't want to hear that. You need to take your functional messaging and weave it into a story that people want to engage with. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, longer form content, really the big benefit is, um, is to sort of gives you that uh, space to let the narrative breathe and to build. And, you know, you can add richness to it. You can layer the story in between mm -hmm. several different stories, which yeah. makes a much more engaging way of sort of weaving in your messaging. Um, and yeah, honestly, I think that's the big sort of takeaway is ultimately it will lead to sort of a more meaningful brand engagement if you mm -hmm. do form content because it gives you that extra space to build. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really it. Uh, Toby asked, how important do I think storytelling is for short form content? Excellent question. Uh, I think that storytelling is a tool in your toolbox, uh, like any other, like humor, uh, and storytelling obviously weaves into that, but you know, not necessarily, you can get humor across with very little amount of storytelling, just, mm -hmm. as, you, just as you can, you know, make a really humorous thing filled with storytelling. Um, to be honest, I think it comes down to 
entertainment value, which I'll like, uh, I can speak so much about, but storytelling is a major component of entertain entertainment value, but it's not the only one. Um, so I think, I think storytelling is the very basics of anything you create, but all rules are meant to be broken and all rules can be broken. Uh, I think it's just a case of knowing a how much storytelling you feel you need to get your messaging across or rather how much storytelling you feel you want to sort of uh wrap your messaging in uh versus what other entertainment values you can sort of add in you know you can make a piece of content which is purely visual doesn't have any real storytelling whatsoever it's abstract and you can infer story from what you're seeing but you know mm -hmm. that's successful just as you can create something which has only storytelling and almost no visuals, say a podcast, for instance, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all a balancing act. Uh, and at the end of the day, what you want to do is, you know, you want to create a more powerful and sort of positive connection with your consumer, with your audience. Uh, and we think that storytelling is one of the major components to achieve that, but not necessarily the only one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, that kind of links really well into shifting towards a more experiential um, strategy when you're approaching something like that. Um, and it's it's just about the fact that functional messaging has been so prevalent that it's actually not interesting anymore. And you're right, people don't want to be advertised to. You don't just want to be hitting them with functional, practical messaging all the time. So mm -hmm. it's about building that emotional connection on a long term yeah. Um, basis and building driving loyalty that way so um, yeah it's really crucial cool. to anything so I, I mean for this for, for long-form video then I mean Heather do you have from a marketing perspective you know do, do, do you have anything more to say on that um, why why it's growing why it's increasing um, I think that I think it's really about the relationship with the, um, the consumer mm -hmm. um, not saying that I mean by no means are we saying that long form content is the is the only thing you should be thinking about. Yeah. Uh, short form content absolutely has its place too. Mm -hmm. um, when we're when we're writing a strategy for a client actually we take the approach we, we always start with a model um I'm about to get a bit academic but um we start with a model by um the knee and field and it's the sales activation versus brand building model and the idea is that you have your sales activation on one side and um, that is about short term getting sales quickly um, mm -hmm. and that's more into the functional messaging kind of thing and short form content and yep. then you've got your brand building which is about um, that more long term view and yeah. you're not Get sales immediately from this um, activity, but you are going to drive loyalty. And really, it's crucial to find a balance between these two things because if you go too excessively on either one, you're not going to have an effect of the strategy. Um, the idea being that when you have your when you're doing your sales activation, the, the short term stuff, you do it quite frequently, and it it kind of builds like this. You get like a peak yeah. of sales the sales um, and you have your brand building activity that really builds long term and um, that if, if those two things work together um, brands will have their brand equity KPIs you know how's my brand performing and they'll also have their sales KPIs like how much product are we shifting or um, what's our service looking like yeah exactly yeah so um, those two things will work together and that just means that your KPIs will increase over time mm-hmm so in response to your question, short form content absolutely has its place in the sense that you can use short form content if you need to push the more functional element. If it's if it's right, we need to, we've got this offer on, um, we need to shift with maybe it's Christmas based things. Um, and it's just about maybe um, YouTube pre-roll, the six second videos that you're yeah. putting try and drive traffic to a website in order to increase conversion um but they also fit really well together long and short form, uh, long and short form content um where you can do things like sequencing um, and you, you maybe start with long and then you retarget with short in order to drive towards the behavior that you're looking for whether that be a landing page or a purchase things like that um so they certainly have their place both of them and they work really well together when you find that sweet spot between brand and activation building 
Yeah. Well, that's the thing, especially with like how short and long form content works together. If you get uh, an audience or a consumer watching a piece of long form content first, which has really good storytelling and really creates an emotional connection, every time you then see even a snippet, a six second cut down or, or whatever it may be that reminds them of the, that longer form piece of content, like the emotional connection is already there. All you're doing is reminding them that that exists. You know, it's so much more powerful. And yeah, it, yeah, and like yeah, definitely. And that's that's essentially um, a strategy that we tend to go for is we start with kind of broad storytelling, get them get them hooked on the, the brand story and get that kind of connection built. And then you can go to like uh, maybe a 30 second video, move to 15, move to six second. Um, and it's just about driving towards that end conversion. Um, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a very long term view. Um, yeah. It's effective. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Cool. Uh, so that's that's long form video. Um, moving on to CG animation. Um, so you know, there's there's kind of been this this trend over the last the last few years of brands relying more and more on CG. And I just mentioned Burberry there. Uh, you know, what do you see as some of the main benefits or or drawbacks of relying on CG versus you know live action production? Yeah, it's, I mean, um, lockdown really sort of, as you said, Heather, lit a fire under this as well in terms of use of CG, because one of the main benefits, it's it can be done by a single person with a computer in their, like, living room or in their bedroom or in their office, and that's all you need to create, like, you know, what can be amazing pieces of content. It's, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at how sort of CG has evolved, you know, five, ten years ago, CG, especially photo real CG, was reserved for big Hollywood studios and they had full teams of animators working on a single piece. And of course that still exists, but now like, you know, anyone with basic computer skills can pick up Cinema 4D and Octane Render uh, and teach themselves how to produce photo real animation. Uh, you know, you need to be a little bit tech savvy, but like it's something you can teach yourself just like on your own. And I mean, the big thing for me is you can literally make anything. Um, you know, if you want, say, uh, a flying spaghetti monster flying over a city made of marshmallows spitting out Chevy cars, I don't know why you would want that for your messaging, but if that's yeah. the messaging that you want, then we can do that. And it's, you know, it's just a bit of upfront work to, to set that scene and to animate it. But, like, literally the sky is the limit. Uh, and it's that is both empowering, but it's also daunting at the same time. You know, if, if the blank mm -hmm. page where you can write any story is daunting, then, you know, yeah, the right. 3D canvas where you can make infinitely more things is, yeah, equally daunting. Uh, but, I mean, it's exciting because the scope of the sort of messaging that you can get across visually is, you know, exponentially increased. And I think that, to me, is the biggest upside, that you can do literally anything and all it takes is a, is a few people working on, on their computers to make that happen. Uh, you know, you can get a lot more adventurous and experimental with, with your with sort of your visuals and your messaging. Uh, so for me, that's the big one. Then repeatability and versatility uh, is also a big one. You know, it's very easy to now do A-B testing where, you know, do audience prefer a green background to a blue one? Shit example, but, you know, you can so easily make those little tweaks. Uh, and at the end of the day, like, yeah, it's, it's a tool in your creative toolbox. Uh, like anything, it's it might be right, it, it might not be, but it it can do amazing things. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. And, and what do you think, Heather? Like from a marketing perspective, then you know, if 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 you're to compare these two mediums, um, how how would you how yeah how would you compare them? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So. That I think that CG is amazing and it's opened up, like said, it's opened up such a massive world of opportunity for brands to do things that they couldn't do before. Um, and it's also kind of something that the consumer is more used to seeing as well. So um, it's, it's like a really appealing piece of content. Um, but I think it's really, it's a really normal thing for a client to wonder, oh gosh, like how much will that cost? And if I was to just mm -hmm. set up a traditional shoot um, compared to an animation, is that going to be loads more money? And I think it's quite it's quite often the case is like, oh, just instantly dismiss it because it's going to cost loads more. 
Um, and really, it depends on what you want to do. Um, if you want your if you want your spaghetti monster, then the animation is is the best way to go. That would be more affordable than hiring loads of uh, Chevy cars and building a city with marshmallows and having to shoot that. So um, certainly, uh, in that case, CG would be cheaper. Uh, quite often, we don't do we don't really deal with spaghetti monsters. Although I'm sure we would love to if anybody wants a spaghetti monster. <laughs> we'll get there love that um we let's take a bottle shot for example if we were doing um a, like really nice styled bottle shoot because we quite often do that for our whiskey clients um the cg animation up front would be more expensive um than just setting up a shoot and and like doing some shots however when we approach content, we all come at, come at it from a really strategic mind and thinking about how we can take a piece of content and make that um, make that a really long-term piece of content out of just one thing. So how can we get longevity out of it? How can we increase the value out of it over a longer period of time than, than the shoot would last for, for example? Um, so in, in the case of the bottle shoot, and I'm not a technical person, so Perry, you might want to jump in and save me if I uh, say things wrong. Go on, go on. <laughs> Say if you had a, a gin um, that was, and it was just your standard gin that you sell, and we did a really nice, uh, like CG animation of this bottle. And then for Christmas time, you have two or three different varieties that you want to sell for cocktails. The labels are um, slightly different. The bottle shape's the same. Um, you might want the background to be changed. Maybe get some like more like kind of small props in the background, things like that. That's a case of um, like you could. You could have it all reshot again, go through the planning and the storyboarding and all that stuff again. Or um, you could jump into the animation and change the label color and change the background to what you want. And really that's much more cost effective. So, and, and you can do that for, uh, for as long as you want. And it's just about injecting freshness into the animation without having to go through the, the long laborious process of shoot planning and hiring cast and getting the crew in and getting the venue and all this kind of stuff. So in terms of cost effectiveness, if you look at um, if you look at approaching CGA with a really long term view, it can be much more beneficial and valuable to mm -hmm. um, what you want to achieve. So it's yeah, that was like quite a long answer to that question. Um, but certainly from a uh, from a normal pre-COVID standard, that would be the answer. But now we've got a number of other considerations when we're shooting, like if we're bringing in an influencer from another country, what if that country goes into lockdown the week of the shoot? That's one of these things that you have to you have to really take into consideration now. So there's a lot more risk there. Um, but as yeah. things open up, it's looking like we'll be able to, um, we, I mean, we've got clients that have been fantastic and have been really open-minded in approaching CG um, as being like the viable option to, to get them through lockdown. And now they've realized how amazing it is and how much is possible. So it looks like as things start to open up, we'll be able to look at the kind of real world shoots, getting that real content in, but also as part of the campaign, introducing CG as, as, as a standard thing. And then you've got a really nice variety of content. Yeah. Freshness in. So yeah. Um, yeah, like there's definitely like pros and cons in comparison. But I think CG is definitely here to stay because there's just so much you can do um, that gets more value out of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As someone who like, you know, spends half the time directing on set and half the time uh, directing sort of in, in CG, the one thing that is really nice about CG is being able to like change things on the fly. Uh, or it's yeah. like when you're on location, then you're shooting something. If if you spot a mis if you don't spot a mistake in the monitor, something in the background or wherever, it's there to stay. It's in, unless you find another take where that doesn't happen. You know you have to look at that. Whereas now it's just a case of like, you know, you spot something and close to delivery, you can just like, oh, actually, can we can we change that? Can we change how that moves? And like, yeah, it, it allows you to be a lot more experimental and take a more iterative to, iterative approach to how you create things. You know, you can you can lay down a, a very basic sort of animatic, like this is roughly how I see the story progressing, and then this happens, and you plop that out, and you can look at that and go, hmm, okay, that's nice, but it's not totally doing what I wanted. It's not giving me that feeling that I was intending. So maybe we need to change this or that. You know, it's yeah, it allows you to be a lot more sort of iterative and experimental with how you create things rather than 
you know, the standard production approach where you, you know, write a script and you make the storyboards and then you go on set uh, with a shot list in hand and you, you do your best to, to follow that plan exactly to the letter and, and maybe yeah. some problems arise, et cetera, et cetera. And you, and you change things. And at the end of the thing, you come down, you sit in the edit bay and you piece it together and go, okay, that's exactly how I planned. And that's what I have now. Uh, and you can change some few things in the edit, but there's only so much scope to do that. Whereas with 3D, it's like, well, so, you know, the world's your oyster. Yeah, exactly. You can put that spaghetti monster anywhere you want. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> when you think about, when you think about um, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the I wrote it down because I was, the, the, the ads, that, the, the, the sequencing, what happened yes. here? Oh, oh yeah, sequencing. Yeah. Yep. About sequencing as well. You could have a nice kind of long form animation, and then you retarget with a shorter one, and you you keep retargeting until you get the desired outcome, as we as we kind of talked about earlier. But what's really nice about that is that um, you might you might have a six second uh, animation that works really really well, but you want to just inject some freshness into it because um, like fatigue does happen. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, the campaign has gone really well. So as as maybe stats start to drop, it's just a case of saying to the studio, "Hey, let's could we do something just a little bit fresher with this?" And um, and it's really it will only take a few hours. And when you compare that to let's think of a whole new campaign and, and how much time that would take and how much resource that would take, it's it's really such a great resource to have. It's really awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah in terms of frequent uh, sequencing, it's a it's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, cool. So uh, we've got we've got just a few more. Um, just seeing the time there, so we'll we'll try to get on so we can get to our Q and A. Um, just keep chucking them in there. If you guys have any questions, uh, this next one is just you know, Perry, you mentioned it earlier, but it's it's comedy and and entertainment and advertising. You know, so you know how much of a focus do you think this should be for for companies when they're commissioning content? More uh, is, is the short answer. As, as a director who cares most about the story and entertainment value, it's like, more please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, my sort of philosophy on it is um, our strategist, Ross, actually summed it up in a, in a pitch once that like just stuck out to me. He said something like, uh, when you're making adverts for TV specifically, you are essentially being invited into people's homes uh, and you should yeah. follow sort of, you should follow etiquette. You should arrive in good spirits and you should... Mm -hmm then you should be an entertaining guest and that to me is like the attitude for creative yeah, nice. that is to be watched you know it's, it's like we said like people don't really like advertising uh it's you know it's necessary and is you will see ads that you're just like oh i'm glad i saw that i'm going to buy that thing so that's exactly what i need but like in general yeah it's people don't want to sit down just to watch adverts um and so like the best way to get around this is to create things that people find enjoyable to watch because mm -hmm. you know why wouldn't you um uh, and th this might seem obvious but i don't think there's enough attention put to it from from a brand side in terms of like no we our aim should be to create things that are enjoyable to watch that have an entertainment value that doesn't necessarily always mean comedy but it, it does mean having an intrigue or being clever or having you know an emotional drama and again it all comes back to storytelling really that's you know, you know that's why entertainment is really it's being served a story of some description uh and so like yeah you are right now it's like in the digital landscape you're not just competing with other brands when you're putting content out there you are competing with other adverts you're also competing with Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Kulu. Uh, yeah. We're also competing with everyone, every single person on YouTube who is making like, you know, their own sitcoms or they're making their own sort of talk shows in their bedroom and they're doing it better than Comedy Central are doing. <laughs> and you're, you're competing yeah. with TikTok videos who are, you know, being reshared on Facebook, but they're algorithmically targeted to you based on your previous interaction with similar videos. Just you can stay on the newsfeed for a little bit longer. You know, it is a wild west out there. And if you need, if you want to stand out, like you need to be entertaining. That's like, otherwise mm -hmm. you're just getting lost in all the noise because there's so much noise out there. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, that for me is like, that's the big one. Yeah, cool. I think that um, that's, that's so crucial, Perry. You're right. It, it's all about bringing in that entertainment value and just and approaching it not from we need to sell this it's how do we how do we make this a memorable 
uh, valuable, meaningful experience for the people watching it and make them want to watch more and make them want to follow us because like even getting someone to follow you and like your page nowadays is like, that's no easy feat. That is a commitment that that person is yeah. making. Um, I don't really have much to add to that apart from that, that when you do create something um, like that, you need to approach it um, really holistically. You need, mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm talking about copy mainly, because um, when I see a social media post, um, like the copy is usually above the film, um, and the film is amazing, it's so engaging, but if the copy doesn't meet that head on, then I'm just gonna scroll past. Um, mm -hmm. there, it, it's something that I think is looked overlooked quite a lot um, and copywriting is something that is not easy it's not straightforward I think a lot of people think that copywriters just sit down and just type some stuff out and it's really it's really not that easy and um, there's a lot of thought that goes behind it so it's about really looking at the personality the tone of voice of your film and yeah. processing it and, and putting it into copy and and not just being not not just having copy that's repeating what's in the film but adding more embellishing more wow. so that the post becomes the experience rather than the the film accompanied by some functional boring copy um i think a really good example of a company that do this are innocent innocent to mm -hmm. me do no wrong i look at their stuff all the time i think they're amazing um but everything that they do is in the very like kind of starky, dry, innocent tone of voice that we all have come to really enjoy at Made Brave. We're constantly sending each other um, innocent posts. Um, so yeah, it's just about uh, making sure that that filters down all the way through everything you do. Well, if you start with a film, then that's great, but let's take what you do and put it all the way through, even down to community management. And yeah. if, that means, if that means that you have to create an FAQ doc for your community managers to um, like see some examples of how to answer questions in the tone of voice that you want them to, then yeah. that's a really useful tool as well. Um, but it's all just about making sure that the user journey is really aligned and um, exactly what you want them to be experiencing. Yeah, exactly. And I think, as you said there, like looking at it holistically, I think it's so important to know what your brand is, what your brand's tonal voice and what their personality is. Because not every brand out there can do like comedy and to do it well. Because like, yeah. you know, there, there's there's a lot of companies out there who that's just not them, which is fair. But then you need to think of another way of getting that entertainment value in there. That mm -hmm. isn't just, you know, yeah, functional messaging. Because yeah, from my point of view, if, if you're specifically talking about comedy, in general, I think functional messaging and comedy are generally at odds with each other, unless you are approaching it from that holistic point of view where you know that, you know, when you are bringing in your functional messaging, it needs to serve a point other than to deliver the message. It needs to give a laugh or it needs to, to like give a, a sort of a clever response. It needs to, yeah, it needs to be considered how it fits over in with the whole piece so that your functional messaging is not just when it's brought into the film, it's not just to answer an audience's need, it's to answer something that happens in the story and to then give, create an emotional response, whether that is a laugh or a, oh, that's clever, or, oh, that's really heartbreakingly sad, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's having that whole oversight when you are when you're creating the content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No easy time. <laughs> cool. Um, so we've got we've got a couple more here. Um, so there's also this you know the, this trend towards kind of less polished visuals um, as well, um, and and we're seeing this more and more uh, in high end production. Uh, wh why why do you think this is this is happening, Perry? Is this a recent thing? Has this been happening for a while? Uh, yeah, it's, I find this really interesting. Actually, there's uh, a couple of things. So. I think TikTok and Instagram in general has, has sort of recently sort of fed into this and made it a little bit more prominent. We are seeing a lot more because more content is being created from everyday users who just have a phone camera. You know, that's definitely a big part of it. But it, it goes all the way back. Uh, I think for me, like, it starts in sort of the 60s uh, when films were being created. It's, it's before French New Wave hit. Uh, and Hollywood or, you know, uh, the big film studios back then, uh, would always avoid having lens flares. And it's such an interesting thing. You'd never see lens flares in old films because 
it was a, a sign of a camera being present because light is hitting the lens. Right. And so making the audience aware that there is a camera. And so Hollywood and other film studios avoided any kind of lens flares. But this created uh, the opposite effect where it, it made lens flares a marker of authenticity because the only time you would see lens flares was in documentaries. Uh, where you didn't have that control over your environment, so there was no way of avoiding lens flares. So audience became attuned to only seeing lens flares in documentaries, which made it uh, a sort of a marker of authenticity. And so Hollywood then started to bring lens flares in because it was now authentic, whereas before right. they did the complete opposite. And you're seeing this continue today with, like, look at big productions these days, especially advertising. You, you're starting to see a lot more handheld. You know, camera operators aren't just like, camera ops are just sticking the camera on a dolly or on, uh, uh, you know, sticks. They're taking it and shooting handheld because the same thing has happened. We've become accustomed to only seeing handheld camera work in documentaries and on sort of independent films and on, on sort of, self shot indies and stuff where yeah it's you don't have that control over the environment and you can't just like stick a dolly track up wherever you're shooting or you, you just don't have it so handheld has now become a marker of authenticity and looking at tiktok and instagram now i yeah. think that evolution is is still continuing along those lines but it's it's a fad like or a trend like any other soon enough handheld like footage won't be be feeling authentic because we're starting to see it pop up more and more in, in blockbuster films and in advertising. So, you know, we'll be desensitized to that. But I think TikTok and, and sort of Instagram is signaling the next trend on this journey. What we're seeing is uh, a lot of sort of people creating content which is doesn't have any artifice. It's, you know, it's not polished, it's not slick, and it's people mm -hmm. not being afraid of being goofy. And I think that's sort of where the evolution is going next. I think sort of give it five years and a big marker for authenticity will be brands creating content that is not taking itself seriously at all, that is goofy and silly and just, yeah, it has that sort of vibe to it that we're seeing being created now sort of from a, a grassroots perspective on, on these content sites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that, um like the the lo-fi content is really interesting and I do completely agree that it makes things more authentic and I also agree that, that is going to become so common that we are desensitized to it but I think yeah it means that it's going to pull back and go to more towards the polished side of things. Yeah. What I really like about lo-fi is how accessible lo-fi is to people because I can make something that's quite lo-fi um, just with my basic skill set um, and it's it's authentic. It comes from a real human being, um, and and it's it's something that someone would expect to see on a social media feed, for example. Um, what I think is interesting is that this lo-fi content, especially with TikTok, can take hours to do. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I downloaded the TikTok and I had it for like two weeks because I was like, no, that's not for me. Um, but and I tried making videos and it just took me so long. It was such a commitment that I just, yeah. was, I've already got my social channels. I don't need to think about another one for my personal brand. Like, no. So um, I think that that's really interesting. It's such a commitment to be a TikToker is a really, really big thing. Um, yeah. But what I think is interesting is that lo-fi content and that type of content like if i say TikTok content everybody knows instantly what that looks like in their heads when brands do that i think that'll be interesting to see as TikTok opens up to advertising more and making it more accessible for brands to advertise because the whole thing is don't make ads make TikTok. um yeah. and so there's a real visual style that goes along with that that brands are going to have to commit to. And I'm wondering if people will be more critical of that because it's coming from a brand. So is it as authentic as it's coming from a brand, um, from a, from how consumers think about it? So I think that there's definitely going to be a fine balance um, when brands are producing that kind of, we're super authentic because of the old planning that's behind it. It's not like a brand is going to wake up one morning and just decide to jump on a TikTok trend. It's going to be something that's really, really planned out and strategic. So yeah. I think that that's definitely one of the It's too early to tell how that's going to go. Um, it's quite difficult and expensive advertising and it's only happening in America just now. So um, I think in the, in the coming months or even in the year, um, I'll be keen to see how consumers respond 
happens to brands advertising on TikTok with like trying to meet that TikTok style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah, it's it's like looking at UGC as well. Uh, the sort of authenticity is the big trapping point, I feel, because if you don't get it right, then it's it's sort of yeah, you know, if you create a piece of UGC content which is then feels scripted, it, it defeats the entire purpose, and it can actually have the opposite effect where it, it can uh, sort of make audiences sort of draw back a little bit because it it feels fake, uh, which is the last thing they want. So it's. Yeah, it's almost a difficult thing where uh, it's paradoxical in terms of like, you almost need to make sure you put more effort into making your UGC or your TikTok content because it needs to feel authentic. Uh, because if it doesn't, yeah. it backfires. Absolutely. Yeah. And then from a cost perspective, that has its own other set of considerations because TikTok is almost like you'll have to brief it separately. It has to be so different to your traditional Facebook or Twitter ad. And it's not a simple case of I need one by one for facebook and i need 16 by 9 for twitter it's that you need a whole different style for tiktok which is going to cost a lot more so really it's about looking at the channels that are accessible to you and picking the ones that are going to have the most value to you and just because tiktok's there and it's and it's booming it might not be right for your brand and that is okay so um it's definitely something that requires a lot of thought because once you've committed to TikTok it's something you have to really take forward otherwise you've just kind of got a dead page that doesn't really do anything on TikTok and that's exactly. that either so yeah I'm I'm really keen to see how that develops in the next few months I'm going to be watching it closely I think I think we all will be definitely cool well we've got we've got one more um just conscious of the time we just have a few more minutes uh and then we'll jump into the Q&A before one o'clock, we've got eight minutes. All right, so VR uh, is, you know, it's been around for years and it's been growing, growing, growing. Um, But especially now, particularly we were talking earlier about experiential kind of going away or being put on pause or, you know, certainly diminished. Um, How do we see this being used for for content and and advertising in the next few months, do you think? VR is super interesting for me. Uh, I managed to get a headset right before lockdown, which was perfect timing because it gave me another form of escape uh, without having to, to leave my bedroom. Uh, I've ever since like the first Oculus five eight years ago, the Kickstarter came out. I've been following it so closely, and I just yeah, I, I find it amazing. Um, and it's a really cool medium to create for. You know, as we said earlier, if three D is is sort of a limitless landscape where you can create anything. Uh, VR is just the next iteration where now you have a limitless landscape where you can create anything, but you can also create it with the intent of people being able to experience it from a first person point of view and being just able to see everything and go in and yeah, it's absolutely amazing. So the, the sort of the having that kind of medium where you can fully immerse someone within a story that isn't just like, you know, it's, it's audio and visual, but it adds perspective and perspective you know just being able to move around it's as you can tell i find it amazing uh but like i think vr is still too far away from being mainstream for us to be creating yeah. content specifically for it for audiences to enjoy because still it's, it's expensive to get into vr it is you need a good computer you need a vr headset it's it, it's pricey but what i do feel is really interesting is um is sort of using it for events because you can immerse your audiences like never before. Uh, and so to create content for specifically VR that is to be enjoyed, say, at an event where you can also you know have people try it and experience what it's like, but then also you can hit them with more sort of uh, functional messaging while they're there. It, I think, honestly, yeah, it's... I think there is no better way to create experiences for audiences that are meant to sort of create a, an emotional connection with the brand. It's, yeah, it's so cool. And I think uh, I've seen a couple of examples out there uh, that really do this very well. Corona did something with The Mill, uh, which I highly recommend everyone check out, the BTS for, uh, where they created this, uh, took this warehouse and they uh, turned it into uh, sort of a, a space to be enjoyed virtually, where they created a VR world in tandem with the warehouse while the VR world was all like tropical landscapes and like bushes and sunshine. And then they augmented that digital experience in the physical space by adding heat lamps, for instance, that you could feel the heat from the sun as you sort of came out 
and uh, and added foliage and fans to create wind. Uh, and yeah, people. The next brand who does that right is uh, is going to sort of gain, I think, a lot of brand saliency and uh, just like a lot of emotional connection with the audience. Yeah, I definitely think so. I think it would be nice to see VR break, kind of bridge the gap between the real world experiences that we can't have just now and the the kind of more traditional, um, the like the digital advertising. Um, but as you say, it needs to be something that's really accessible, and not many people have that technology. And it's almost like we need a uh, um, we need a uh, we need it to be more commoditized. We need like a gate come out where everybody suddenly rushes to buy one and then we'll be able to consider it as being like a really valuable channel um but as you say because not me i don't have one keenan do you have one like we don't <laughs> so no. i think that um although like i love the idea of doing vr and i and i think that it would be awesome to see it bridge the gap um we might have to just wait a little while for it to become more of a mainstream thing um, yeah Exactly. There's also um, the other element which VR is very exciting for, which is virtual production that you're starting to see more and more. Uh, which, if you look at how The Mandalorian was produced by Industrial Light and Magic, uh, they use they replace green screens with physical LED screens uh, and using camera tracking and real time render engines like Unreal to to yeah do sort of. Um, virtual backgrounds on the fly that respond to your camera movement and it's entirely in sync and it looks amazing and it means you don't have to do any post-production of like comping out green screens and fiddling with perspective it's all handled on the fly and it gives your actors sort of the, the visual stimulus of their environment to, to sort of react to rather than just like a green space super interesting I think uh, it's you know I've been seeing things bubbling in the background and uh yeah a year from now it's going to be all the rage Keenan, i think we'll have a whole separate webinar about vr just for perry <laughs> absolutely great i can chat for so long <laughs> cool uh well let's uh let's just jump into our q a really quick uh just before we head away uh we've got one here from katie so she says that tiktok feels like such a young platform i struggled to engage with it but I see the value in it. So my question is, how would you recommend transitioning to that platform naturally? Um, I think that's a really good question. And it's one that so many people will be asking themselves right now. I think uh, just really download it, start an account and just immerse yourself in it for a little bit. Don't feel pressure to create content right away. Just get a really good idea of what people are doing on it. Um, They've got the like they've got tons of trends on there that you'll see that you might think, oh, that might be good, that might be good. And just kind of take notes. You don't need to action anything right away, but just take notes on your learnings and what might work for your brand. Um but as I say, don't pressure yourself to to be on TikTok if it's not right for your brand. And it could be that you need to like ask some marketing consultants, what do you think? Maybe do like a, like a bit of exploration and research, ask your customer base. Maybe you've got some like a um, like a really good set of customers that you could do a bit of a research group with. Um, but certainly just download it, immerse yourself in it and don't pressure yourself. Um, I think when TikTok exploded onto the scene, all the brands were like, oh my gosh, what do we do? I need to do something because there's all the kids are on it and all this stuff. But with, and that's great. But um, I think I think putting pressure on yourself and, and going too soon before you're ready might do more harm than good. Um, so just really make sure that if you come up with a TikTok strategy, that you do your research, really immerse yourself in it and get a great idea of what it is you want to do and just plan out your content really well and come up with a style that's gonna be authentic without making it look like you're just trying to be one of the kids. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. I think, yeah, as I said before, the potential backlash of creating something for the platform that doesn't feel right for your brand, you know, it, it, it doesn't speak your tone of voice. Um, and it, it just seems like you're, you know, jumping on the bandwagon. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's going to do more damage than good. But again, it's TikTok is like a place to grow your audience is massive. You know, compared to Instagram, it's so easy to, to gain a big audience uh, because it's, yeah, for some reason, it, it's, it's just easier. I don't know why, uh, but that seems to be the case from what I've read. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a case of, as you said, Heather, really doing your research and also 
yeah, finding that one thing, that one sort of either visual style that feels cohesive with TikTok, but also with your brand where the two meet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to look for that and, and yeah, wait until you get the right thing and then jump on it. Otherwise, yeah, there's there's no point. Totally. Cool. Uh, well, that's uh, that's one o'clock. Thanks so much uh, to Perry. Thanks to Heather. Thanks to everybody for coming along and spending your lunch with us. Um, there are a couple things that you can do if you want to learn more about all of this. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of the broadcast, we're going to be putting a, a, a blog out later this afternoon. Um, that'll be it'll go into even more detail. We've got plenty of uh, examples on there and things, um, so you'll see that uh, uh, all across all of our channels here pretty soon. Uh, then, of course, if you need help building a content strategy, we do that sort of thing around here. Um, we have a whole team that's dedicated to doing that. Um, and we'd love to, to chat with you about how we can help bring your brand to life. So um, if, if you head to maybrave.com, there's a little contact us tab there. And that is how you contact us. Um, anyway, <laughs> thanks very much, guys. Um, and we hope to see you all again on the next one. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.